Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, some of us were very glad that nobody got seriously sick because they were borrowing our cars. <laughs> so I'm very glad nobody got sick. Um, I want to uh, continue with my, my uh, giving thanks because, um, you know, I'm, I'm really learning. It's very difficult to be a griper and a complainer when you're thankful. And so today I want to say thank you to the leadership team here at Jesus Community Church. Uh, we have Matthew. Matthew, go ahead and stand so everybody can see you. So just in case anybody's about Matthew, stand up. <laughs> now you're all embarrassed. Steve? <laughs> And Dennis. Go ahead and stand up, Dennis. Okay, okay, now you guys can stand. Um, you know, these guys are the men that God has called at this point to come alongside uh, to give me godly counsel, to share the experience, the wisdom that God has given them, uh, to keep things moving in the right direction in this church. Any success that I might have is built on the foundation that they helped give me. So, you know, when your toilet's flush, it's because these men are taking care of things. When the lawn is mowed, it's because these men are taking care of things. They see what needs done. When there is a, a spiritual need in the body, these men are the ones that are stepping up. Okay? So, I want to say thank you because uh, it's very obvious that God has appointed and is using these men. Thank you very much. Now, we are also going to continue with our testify. And I've asked Dennis, now that he's all embarrassed and blushing, I've asked Dennis if he would come up and, and share with us his testimony. Got water in my eyes before we even start. <laughs> so here we are. He, find, he pinned me down to ask if I would do my testimony today. And so I've given it great thoughts, and I, and I felt, I hope you all won't be bored today, but I feel that it's a little more important to, once you become a Christian, your part of your testimony is what you've done with your life with Christ after you become saved. Mm -hmm. So that's what, this, that's what I'm going to give you this morning, is Dennis in a nutshell. So... Anyway, I want you to know that I was born again, believe in Jesus Christ, and I am also a godly man. And I hope by the tour I get done here today, you'll know that there is a difference. So, uh, my grandfather was a Methodist preacher in Corvallis. My mother was a believer, obviously, being the daughter of a pastor. And uh, so, I was lived in half of a Christian home. My father was not a believer, but he did not downplay or discourage or put any uh, negativity toward Christianity. So I would go to church on Sunday morning with my mother, and, and then in 1954, at Vacation Bible School in Hamilton, Montana, at the Assembly of God Church on Main Street, I accepted Christ as my Savior. And that was it. You know, I don't remember what any of the classes were that we took or anything about the course or the week. But I do remember on the last day, sitting in the pew, the gentleman came beside me and asked me if I would want to go forward and accept Christ as my Savior. And I did so. And I'm so glad that I did. So, I've learned early on or reflecting back on those times that I obviously received the, the spiritual gift of faith at that point in time. Because a year or two later, why well, I was reading in the Bible, and I read the, came across this verse. And it's in Revelations, in verse 7. And it says, Then I heard a number of those who were sealed, 144,000, from all the tribes of Israel. Now when you're 10 or 12 years old, you don't realize what all that, the context of what that passage is talking about. The one thing, I didn't have a clue what Israel was, what it was, where it was, or anything about it. And to me, in my mind, the term 
sealed meant saved. So to me, there were going to be 144,000 people saved. That's what my interpretation of that passage. And in my faith, knowing that 144,000 is not very many people, but I knew I was going to be one of them. So that was a cool thing. So then we skip ahead in time, got into high school, got into the, the, the wrong crowd of young people, uh, you know, built my testimony a little bit, had a little bit of, you know, alcohol in my life and partying and doing some fun things. But through all of that, God always protected me. He stood by beside me and just did many miraculous things in my life. And I could stand here for another two hours giving you examples of answered prayer that I had at that point in time. Then in 1965, I got married, met my wonderful wife, uh, who God sent to me. And through that period of time, you know, I wasn't really walking with the Lord, but, you know, we'd go to church occasionally. And, uh, you know, I obviously knew who God was, and, and I always was a person who would always pray, especially, unfortunately, when I needed it most. But then, in 1967, when we started having children, and so I and I felt a little more convicted and drawing closer to God and living a more godly life. And in 68, I believe it was, God convicted me that I should become baptized. So I went to the, we were going to the Catholic Church at the time. So I went to their courses and on Easter weekend, I became a certified card-carrying Catholic, baptized, confirmed in the church. So I, I got to cover both ways, Catholics and Protestants, you know, I, I'm, I'm in. So, in 1981, we were attending church in Hamilton, and the priest was talking about war and the terrible things of war, and how horrible the MX missile was, and all of these sorts of things. And I was so spiritually filled from that message that I never went back. <laughs> and we, we then went, came, started coming to the Evangelical Free Church here in Stevensville, where my, pup, my brother was the pastor. And we attended weekly services there until they had a, they had a, uh, big blow up within the church, and in 1983, Rex and a group of us came over here and started Jesus Community Church. So it was interesting in preparing for this morning when I realized that this is 30 years we've been coming here. Amazing. So we have spent, I spent then the next 10 years coming to church, you know, doing my thing, I sat right there where Josh is sitting every Sunday morning so that I could freely get up and exit after service and go on and about my life and enjoy things, thinking that, that, you know, things were okay. I had a wife, family, good home, good job, uh, coming to church, worshiping Jesus, and I thought I had it made. I was the wife in the fast way. However, my philosophy in life was totally wrong. And just to kind of give you a picture of where I was, why well, I, I was a, a, I was a licensed lancer there, and to become that, why you have to have so many years of, of schooling, so many years of practical experience, and then you go drive to Helena and you take a surveyor's test, and so if you get a good enough score, you're a surveyor, and they give you a license. So that was my philosophy in life. I have become saved. I accepted Christ as my Savior. I'm now a born again Christian. That's all I need in my life. You know, that's all that's expected of us. However, that is not the real end of the story. Then in 1991, my life began to change. In April, I had a, one of my employees pass away. He worked on Thursday took a Friday off and died Saturday morning. And, you know, that was quite a shock. 
But on that same day, I not only lost an employee, I lost my oldest brother, I lost a good friend, and I lost my pastor in one day. That was quite an experience that I don't want to ever live again. But then in June, I had a wedding, gave away my oldest daughter. And in July, I had another wedding and gave away my youngest daughter. And unfortunately, everybody's so happy about weddings and they're so wonderful. But dad here, they were funerals to me. I lost my children. And it was not a good experience. And then to top it all off in September, doing the earthly thing, I had an opportunity to go up to British Columbia and go moose hunting. Thing I, you know, I've killed many animals, but I've never gotten moose. So we went up there and hunted for 14 days and didn't see one. So there's a bunch of money out the tube and I had my wife when I got back. So, <laughs> so that was really a historic point. <laughs> so, that's bad deal. So in 1993, we had an opportunity. She was sharing with me that she would like to go to Israel. And we, we were watching on television a gentleman by the name of Zelda Levin and his ministry and his talks. And we, had, we bought his tapes and we studied those and we bought his books. And, and we really truly felt that we wanted to go to Israel at that time. So I was kind of reluctant on the basis that 14 days, I don't know if I could go on a 14 day fast. Because I was concerned about what their food would be like. <laughs> but I have one taste bud and I treasure it. <laughs> so I was afraid of what the food might be like. So anyway, through a series of things, why we ended up going over there. And it was a wonderful experience. It was so good that we've been there four times. And I'd recommend it to anybody and everybody to hear it. It's a life-changing experience, which I'm going to share with you, if I can. So anyway, Scott here today, he started this crying business. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we were in the upper room of the, in downtown Jerusalem, where they had the last supper. And Jesus spoke to me, and I won't bore you with what he said, very difficult, but it's such a shameful thing that Jesus, God, has to take his time out to talk to a person, and it shouldn't, should not happen. You should be more godly than that, and more attuned what he did for you on the cross. But anyway, he did. And my life changed. So it is in Habakkuk. I looked this passage up yesterday. In Habakkuk 3.16 it says, When I heard, my body trembled. My lips grieved, quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself. That was me at that moment. So anyway, we came back. I was a changed man. I hope that it was visible in my family. I, I know it was visible in my church because I wanted to be closer to God. I wanted to serve Him more. I wanted to be the man that God saved me for. So at that point, I had been totally broken before the Lord. And just to kind of give you an ex, uh, a picture of what brokenness is, just take a moment and picture a, horse, a wild horse out in the, in the uh, countryside or in your backyard or a free running wild horse. And he is free to run and do whatever he wants to. And that is a picture of us, for me at least, as I'm independent, individual. I did my own thing. I lived my life for myself. 
and for my own pleasures. <clears throat> then you take that horse and you capture it, you put it in a corral. That's what Jesus does when he gets a hold of your heart and you accept him as your savior and you become born again. You are now in his corral and confined within his rules of li living. And then he gets on you and he rides you and you buck and you run in circles and try to, try to throw off the shackles that's sitting on your back as the horse does. That is, we live trials and tribulations that we live through in life that, that God gives to us to turn us in, to, to sharpen us and to make us better believers. And then finally, as you take this fine horse that you've now ridden, you put a beautiful saddle on it, and it goes out and it does whatever you ask it to do, whether it's to chase cows, whether it's to ride long races, or whatever you do, that horse is happy and willing to, to do what this master asks it to do. And so it is that by being saved, you become a godly man and you want to please God. So then after that, when we got home after my thumbs, I became a very active member in Promise Keepers, was a local ambassador, and we held several uh, events down at the, in Hamilton for three or four years while I was very active. I became a deacon in this church and became active in doing, serving in this church and doing things. And today, I consider myself a godly man. It's interesting. I was working one day, and a gentleman came in. And he, was, he was a client, so it was a total stranger. And uh, he came in, and he said, you got a minute? I said, yeah. I said, well, you're a godly man, he said, aren't you? I said, yeah. So we went in, and I counseled with him for a couple of hours. And it was quite a, it was a blessing to be able to share with him what God had done in my life, to be able to give him biblical truths of how he should live his life. And it was just an experience. But it was just, it struck home to me that, wow, this guy recognizes me as a godly man. And it's quite a burden on a person when you really consider uh, that you have to now live up to that feeling. You have to be careful. You have to stay totally focused on your walk with Christ. And Peter and Paul, and James said it best. In James 1.1, 1, 1, Greetings to the twelve tribes. James, a bondservant of God and, a, and to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what I am today as a bondservant. Not that I have all the answers. Still a, I'm still a sinner. I'm still selfish. But at least I know when I'm being that way and I try hard every day to take that out of my life. Thank you. For those of you that looked at Dennis as the hard masculine exterior, there's a soft nougat inside. <laughs> he tries to keep it hidden. <laughs> but we know it's there. Um, what, what, just fantastic. I love this testify. Because I just, I love to see God moving in people's lives. You know, and it's not a one-time event. Okay? It's, it's not like, okay, I, I prayed a little prayer and that was 15 years ago and here I am. You know, there's, there should be lots happening between then and now. And, and I would love to hear what's happening between then and now. Um, we are in Colossians, chapter 2. You know, I've been struggling with this message for a couple weeks. Because I, I was talking with Christy this morning, and I said, I feel like I'm trying to take over 4,000 years worth of God doing stuff. Somebody moved my bookmark. Thankfully, I know where Colossians is. <laughs> Four thousand years worth of preparation, and I'm going to try and condense it now into 30, 40 minutes. And I'm not sure 
all of the parts are important. All the parts are vital. So I'm, I'm trying to choose between this diamond and that diamond, which one to set down for today and which one to take up, and which one to hold on to. Now, one of the things that has kind of been boggling my brain for, for several years now, I can't fathom, I don't understand the fascination in this country with zombies. I don't get it. You know, I, I just don't. Zombies, you know, there's zombie this and there's zombie that and the dead are coming and the dead are going to eat you and, and you know, I, and there's things all over and a zombie apocalypse, what guy would you be? I wouldn't be here. Uh, but I don't understand what the whole fascination with the zombies. Now, I'm not going to get into this today, but I do believe that there's a spiritual reason for this. I believe scripture lays out that there will be a zombie apocalypse. Not quite like Hollywood says, but I, I think there will be a zombie apocalypse. We'll talk about that later with you when we get into a little bit of eschatology. Eschatology, study the end times. But today, we're going to talk about dead man walking. Dead man walking. So you flip open to Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to start reading. I'm going to pick up in verse 11. Last week we talked about human tradition, philosophy, the lies that the world has to offer because they rejected Christ. So they've got to come up with something that sounds plausible, but it's, it's just empty deceit. It's a lie. There's no fullness to it. And then we talked about why is it that in Christ is the truth, and it's because ultimately he's the one with all authority. He's the one that knows how it's supposed to operate, how it's supposed to work. <coughs> Paul, carrying on in that same thought, says in verse 11, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, I told you last week, I'm really excited about this message. Because this message is what this is all about. Okay? This message is the whole reason any of us is and should be here. Dead man walking. See, welcome to zombie land because the world around us is populated with dead people that don't realize they're dead. They're still going through the motions of life, but they have no life in them. They still do the things that we do. They get up, they breathe, they eat. They go through all the mechanisms of life, but they do not have life. They're dead. Now, starting off, Paul says, In him... You were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, circumcision in the Old Testament, we know the little snippy snippy. Okay? There was a removal of flesh that was a symbol, a seal of the covenant. Basically, when you had that procedure done, you were agreeing to, I am a part of this covenant, or at least your parents were committing you on, on their behalf. You know, I mean, when you're eight days old, you don't really have a lot of thought about what you want to do with your life. So in the Old Testament, there was a physical circumcision, a mark of being participant in that covenant. Now in the New Testament, there is still a removal, there is still a circumcision, but it's on a level that is far superior to the old. Okay? Because... There were other people that may have been circumcised. Now, one of, the, one of the most, I think, horrific stories in the Old Testament 
as this town of people, one of the young men in the town fell in love with a Hebrew girl and said, I, I want that girl. And the brother, because he acted inappropriately, he said, oh yeah, 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 yeah you can have the girl. Just only, only if you and every male in your town gets the snippy. Okay, now this dude's in love. Because he said, okay. That's love. All right. So the entire, every male in that town is circumcised. Now obviously this is a very painful thing because the brothers came in and wiped out every male in that town to redeem their sister's honor. Okay. So, I, I don't, you know, there's this whole connection with circumcision in the Jewish faith that we don't really get because we're not under that covenant. We have a newer covenant, a better covenant. But to understand the similarities, there is a cutting away of you when you come to Christ. Okay, it's not just a little piece of flesh. See, when you come to Christ, all of you has to go. See, we're dead men walking. We're already dead. We're dead in our trespasses. We're dead in our sin. We're a stench before God. We stink of death. They called Jesus the first fruits of the dead. Okay? Now, there were other people that were resurrected before. I mean, Jesus did it several times. Paul had done it. You know, they, um, okay, I just lost his name. The iron and the water Elijah. floated. Elisha. Well, actually, I think both of them, Elijah and Elisha, raised to the dead. But what was the problem with that? They raised him from the dead, and then they died again. Now, Jesus is the first fruits because he's the only one that raised from the dead, never to die again. Okay? So, when you come to Christ, there's death. You're already carrying death around with you. And this is where baptism comes in. Baptism being the symbology of that death. We are put under. We are washed clean. We are resurrected anew into new life. For us, the first life we've ever had. Ever had. Now, this is something that I, I was... I'm absolutely amazed at the way God orchestrates things. You know, I was listening to that first song. You know, indescribable. That we can't describe God. And he puts the stars in place, and he calls them by name. I have trouble with just getting my kids' names right. <laughs> you know, my poor dad, he had five kids, and he'd get after one of us, and, and when he couldn't remember our name, it was always Harry Schwartz. So I grew up with a lot of Harry Schwartz. <laughs> okay? But God knows every one of the stars, and he knows them by name. Okay? God has the very... Number the hair of your head. Some of us less, some of us more. Okay? He is the God that knows the infinity of space and he measures it with his hand. Okay? It's about that big. He sits enthroned above the heavens. And this God came down to earth on my behalf. He's dead and he needs life. And I'm the only one that can give it to him. And he came down to earth. Philippians says that he humbled himself even to taking on, the, not just to be a man, but he took on the role of a servant. So he didn't come in all due majesty as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He came as a servant. And not just a servant into a high house. He came as a suffering servant. Despised. And we did not esteem him. We've been talking in uh, the brothers meeting. We're, we're in John. This week we were in John chapter 19. And, and one of the things that just keeps coming up that, that amazes me. Is that the people that persecuted Jesus. The people that despised him most were the people that of all people in the world should have been welcoming him and worshiping him and knowing who he was. Because it was the people that God entrusted his word to. 
he entrusted his plan to. The teachers of the law, the law, the very law, the very writings that declared his coming. And I mean, not, not even just saying, at some point down the road, there's going to be a dude. He will be born of a virgin. I will call him out of Egypt. He will be born in Bethlehem. I mean, they go on and on and on. In Corinthians it says, the Jews look for a sign and the Greeks pursue wisdom. The Jews kept coming to him and saying, hey, you know, what, what signs do you have that prove this? Well, let's see, I raised you know, five, six, seven, eight people from the dead. Oh yeah, I did the feeding of the 5,000. I also did the feeding of the 4,000. You know, how many miracles did they really want? You see, the, the, the condition was not on their ability to see his miraculous power. The condition was on they were dead men walking. And the one that had life, they rejected. See, this is what is an absolute marvelous thing. One of the Gospels tells us that when they came to arrest Jesus, he said, I am he, and boom, everybody fell down. See, man didn't come and take hold of Jesus and drag him kicking and screaming to the cross. He went willingly as a sheep to the slaughter. He went willingly. Pilate, in total confusion of mind about the proper order of authority, says, don't you know I have authority to condemn you or to set you free? How amazing is that? He's speaking to the one that created it all. And he says, don't you know I have authority? God, can you just picture the irony here for a minute? And Jesus says, you wouldn't have any authority, except it was given you from above. So, the absolute marvelous picture here, let's look at this. We have been circumcised by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried, I'm in, in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Listen, people, you're alive. There is life here. There is not life out there. There's only death. There's life here. The world has some fancy tricks and some incredible illusions. Hey, smoke a little bit of this and all your problems will go away. And you wake up and realize you don't have any more money to buy any more stuff to go smoke. Find happiness in this. Gather for yourself money and security. Now, I tried to do the math one time. I was looking at the life of Solomon. And it talked about how much gold came to him personally. Now, not having really a certainty how much a talent of gold was, but kind of averaging between the low end and the high end. I just kind of took the middle ground. Okay. Personally, Solomon had about $42 billion a year coming into him. $42 billion a year. That's a lot of money. And Paul, or and Solomon said, this is all meaningless. It's meaningless. I've read account after account. You know, the, uh, the train barons back in the 1800s. These guys made millions of dollars. They went from brakemen and grunt laborers to millionaires. And at the end of their lives, none of them were happy. None of them were happy because money doesn't give you the answer. 
Well, it gives me security. There is no security in money. Just ask those people when, when the housing economy bottomed out and they lost all kinds of money. I have a second cousin who had invested heavily, and that was his retirement. Guess what? His retirement's gone. Gone. The only security that we have is being sheltered under the wing of the Almighty. That's it. Okay? And if all of your money is gone and you are sheltered under the wing of the Almighty, you have nothing to fear. But if all you have is a large bank account, a nice investment portfolio, you're in, you're in trouble. And it won't bring you the joy and the happiness that you're seeking. God made alive together with him. Now this, I love this. People, we have to understand this. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. You know that sin in your past that you did, that you keep locked away in that closet, that you don't share with anyone? He's forgiven that. You don't know the sin of tomorrow that you're going to do? He's forgiven that. See, if, if that wasn't the case, then Christ would repeatedly have to go back to the cross over and over and over again. It would not ever be sufficient. Once and for all, the sacrifice was made. Once and for all. It's a marvelous, beautiful thing. Now, Paul goes on to say, what then, do we use that as an excuse to continue sinning? Absolutely not. Because then we make mockery of what he did. You know, there are a number of things that really get under my skin, but boy, I get really hot. When I hear pastors stand up and they, they malign this word by interpreting it according to what they want, not what it says. I get so frustrated when I hear, well, this doesn't apply today. You just call God stupid. Because if he knows all things at all times, when he wrote this, he knew you'd be reading it today. And obviously, your God is feeble because he didn't have the power to keep his word intact from then to now. He might still be everywhere, but you just call him stupid and feeble. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is not does this apply today, but how does this apply to me? It always comes back to you can't approach God on your terms. You have to approach God on His. Always. Always, always, always. Okay? We have to understand we are dead in our trespasses and that it's only through Him that we have life. We come to Him through the blood of the cross. Bloodshed on our behalf. Now, do I have a righteousness? My, my righteousness is so lame. You know? I do something good and I'm like, oh yeah, did you check that out? Did you see what I did? And then I just lost whatever credit I would have gained for having done the good thing. Thank God it's not dependent on my righteousness. It's on His. It's the righteousness of Him that He gives to me. But that, that it doesn't end there. Look, check this out. Okay? He cancels the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Now, wrap your brains around this. God established what was right and what was wrong. God determined what the law was. God determined what the punishment for violating that law was. God, God did that. Okay? Now, you know what's amazing? In the Garden of Eden, there was one rule to break. It seems like you 
have been so easy to not break that one rule. I mean, we got millions of them. No, I'm not talking living according to the law. I'm just trying to put things in perspective. Okay? There was one rule. Don't eat that tree. Don't eat a bat. Don't eat that banana. Why's it got to be an apple? <laughs> it could have been a coconut. We don't know. But don't eat that. That seems like it would have been so easy. And you, right along with me, would have eaten it. God knew it. So he made the law. He set it in place. The law is not evil. It makes us aware of evil. The law is a huge, flashing, neon sign. Bigger than anything in Las Vegas that says, You need a Savior! That's what the law is. Okay? Nowhere does God say, if you fulfill all the law, I'll save you. Then I'll be pleased with you. It doesn't say that. Why? Because we can't. It was put in place to let us know we need Him. I think Paul writes in Galatians, it's the tutor. But something better has come. Something better. So, God puts this in place. This is what is due. Your life. Your life is due. You have violated my law. You violated my decree. You have violated my holiness. This is the cost. Your life. You can't pay that. So he says, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. You know, it, it's funny because in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, I know every one of us has a record of wrongs done against us. Okay? Every one of us keeps a record. You know, I mean, I still find myself every once in a while, I think of something that happened when I was 15, 16 years old, and I'll get edgy. Oh, I could see that guy again. I'd show him the book. Can you imagine what God's record of wrongs looks like for your life? <laughs> For my life? Because remember, it's not just what we do. It's what we think, what we are. Those things that are in here that may never, ever make it out here. He holds those against us as well. And yet he cancels the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. Now listen to me. This is, this is awesome. This is awesome. If this doesn't excite you, and people... I don't know what is wrong with you. I, I really don't. But if this doesn't excite you, he says, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Okay? See, we look at the cross as the death of Jesus Christ. And that's where it is. But it's also the death of my sin. Yes. Do you get that? It is the death of your sin. It's on the cross. That's exciting to me. Yeah. That's life. No longer am I a dead man walking. No longer am I the zombie walking through life. <laughs> I'm not that anymore. Okay? I have life. But then he goes on and he says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. What rulers and authorities is he talking about? Trust me, he's not talking about President Obama. That's, spiritual. That's right. The spiritual authorities of this world. Remember when Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood? What do we wrestle against? 
Yeah. Yeah. See, the enemy is smart. The enemy doesn't put himself in front of us because we can look at him and go, oh no, I don't want any of that. He comes at us through people, through circumstances. We're not wrestling against those. But God took those authorities. He disarmed them. They have no power. Their weapons are gone. And the authorities and put them to open shame. That shame for everyone to see. Everyone to see. By triumphing over them in Him, in Him being Christ. You know, I, it, it amazes me what suckers we are sometimes. What suckers we are. Because, you know, I, I, I'm going to talk about politics here, but I'm not talking about politics. I'm using this as an example. We have men that we trust to lead our country that misuse and abuse their power and their position. And it comes to light and we go, for shame, for shame. And yet they stay in office and we still vote for them. And we, we, we just, you know, what happens when a big thing comes out? Okay? Somebody comes to me and talks, wants to talk about something that I've done wrong. What do I want to do? How about them Padres? <laughs> what do we do? We want to talk about something else. We want to defer and deflect. See, that's why there's so much confusion and chaos in this world, because the enemy is deferring and deflecting. He's, he's pushing... He's putting a, a, an illusion in front of us. Because he had been put to open shame. Now don't get me wrong, people. He is wily, he is cunning, he's deadly. Jesus says that he comes to kill, to steal, to destroy. Okay? He's a roaring lion walking around looking for whom he may devour. You think the enemy has nice plans for you? God must be blessing me because I got all kinds of money. I'm in good with God. All of a sudden I don't need God anymore because I've got money. You think the enemy's plans for your good? He despises you. He detests you. And I, do. I find it funny that when James is writing about the enemy, he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But that's predicated on the statement that goes before that. Does anybody know what the statement is before that? What's that? That's right. Humble yourself to God. See, if you are not humble before God, if you come at the enemy in the arrogance of your own strength, he's going to wad you up like a little rubber ball and bounce you all over the street. Because you don't have what it takes to defeat the enemy in and of yourself. It's only through the cross that he's defeated. Only through the power of God that he is defeated. As a matter of fact, I believe it's Jude goes so far as to say that when the archangel Michael was contesting over the body of Moses, he didn't dare bring accusation against the enemy. I'll tell you, I get so tired of people going, talking smack to the devil. Why are you wasting time talking to him? Really? You can talk to the creator of heaven and earth, the ultimate authority, the one that knows everything, and you're going to waste your time talking to a liar? Would you rather talk to your best friend or your worst enemy? 
Seems like an easy choice. God has already put him to open shame. He's broken his power. He cannot do anything against us but what God allows. And God always gives us a way to withstand. Right? He always gives us a way to withstand. Now, the enemy comes to tempt us. God allows it to try us. You, you see the difference between the two? Why does God let this happen? Peter goes so far as to say, why are you surprised? Why are you surprised? God wants you to be refined. That's the part that Dennis is talking about, being a godly man. Okay? When we come to Christ, that's not it. That's the beginning of it. That's the start. Then we go on to maturity. That we may be complete. I love my grandbabies, but I tell you what, if they're grandbabies for all their lives, I'd get tired of it real quick. I would. Especially as they continue to grow. Yeah, man, you try carrying around a 14-year-old, 200-pound baby. <laughs> But how many of those do we have in the church? You know, oh, I've been saying for 27 years this March. So you're a 26-year-old baby. But God calls us to be mature and complete. That we would not lack anything. So how do we do that? We get in and we walk. Now, it's His strength, not ours. Remember the yoke? Remember we talked about the yoke? He says, take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy and light. That's because he's doing all the work. We really mess ourselves up when we try and handle it on our own. We really do. I got this, God. I got this. Now, Titus loves to sit in Papa's truck. He loves pushing the buttons and steering the wheel. And he'll even crawl down and play with the pedals. Do I let him do it while the truck is running? Do I let him do it while it's in gear? Heck, most of the time I don't let him do it at all. I don't like getting in, turning the key, and having the radio go, Wah! wipers are going, and things are. What the? Well, how did this happen? Every finger in the family points to Titus. Okay, but that's kind of how we are. We want to jump in and take control of everything with no understanding of how it operates, how it functions, how best to complete it. We're not called to do that, people. That's what's so marvelous about this. He's taken all the burden on himself. All of it. That's the whole bargain that he made at the cross. That's the new covenant. We come to him in faith. We obey, but he gives us the strength to do all of it. That's, that's what's so marvelous about this. I'm not accountable anymore for my sin, for my error, for my goof-ups, for my stupidity. I, I share it with you people. I have a real problem with stupid people. Okay? I don't have a problem with ignorant people. Because ignorance just is a lack of knowledge. You can fix that. I've got a lot of ignorance. You guys should have seen when they were doing all this over here. I don't know why. But there are people that know how to do it, and that's, that's great. And I can learn from it. That's ignorance. We can fix ignorance. Stupidity is reveling and relishing your ignorance. You don't want to fix it. You just want to stay stupid. And I have a problem with that. And, and you will hear, what do I call myself when I'm angry at myself? Van Note. Van Note. I don't refer to myself by my first name. When I do something stupid, it's like Van Note. Hmm. Dang it. And yet over and over and over again, I exhibit my stupidity by trying to take it on myself. I'm trying to do it myself. You know, God, I got this one. I, I think I can handle that. You, well, son, you still can't reach the pedals. Sure I can. If I reach down like this, and but then you can't see where you're going. Well, it's a straight road. For now. I mean, really, we all have discussions like that with God, don't we? Okay? 
See, this is so marvelous. He's wiped away everything that would separate me from him. I have righteousness on my own that lets me stand before God, pure and clean, that allows him to embrace me, that allows him to do as he will in my life, that gives, he gives me the strength to do what he will in my life. And I tell you, there's a lot of times that I just, I need that strength. I gotta have that strength. You know? Um, it's amazing. He's so faithful. It's the best thing here. What we read today, I mean, this is the center of it all. This is the heartbeat of it all. Without this, all the rest of it's dead. All the rest is meaningless. Abraham, Joseph, Job, Matthew, Mark, Paul, Peter, all, all of it's gone because without the point of the cross, the crux of it all, this all falls apart. That's marvelous. Absolutely. Father.